Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us on our um, third installment of Mac Reads. Um, and I see that Jenny's there. Jenny, can you unmute yourself? Okay. I just made you a co-host, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Leonard, I've done the same for you. So Jenny, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Now? Okay. Here I am. Good evening. Good evening, Jenny. Um, okay. Well, we'll get started. I want to thank everyone for joining us for our third installment of the Mac Reads 2021 um, Becoming Anti-Racist. Mac Reads is an ongoing partnership between the McMinnville Public Library, Linfield University, and Third Street Books. This year's program will take us on a three-month journey to reflect on the role of racism in our daily lives and our community. It is not our intention to shame anyone or to call anyone out as a racist. Instead, we would like to explore ways that each of us can become an anti-racist through films, books, and conversations. Tonight, we continue the journey by exposing the lie of biological race. During February, we're featuring the film series Race, The Power of an Illusion, all three films are available for streaming through the McMinnville Public Library or Linfield Libraries, and both libraries still have those on DVD for checkout as well. Is there anything you'd like to add this evening before we get started, Jenny? Um, firstly, thank you so much, Jenny, for all that you've done for this um, Mac Reads. It's been fantastic, and I really appreciate the guest speakers. Look forward to hearing from Leonard Finkelman as well. And uh, I really encourage people to um, engage with the upcoming books as well. Thanks. Great. Well, tonight it is my pleasure to introduce Leonard Finkelman. Leonard is an associate professor of philosophy at Linfield University. He earned his PhD in philosophy of science at the City University of New York. He also holds a master's degree in earth science from the University of Oregon. His research focuses on methods and practices in paleontology. And I know this statement to be true, that he loves dinosaurs as much as your four-year-old does. So Leonard, if you would like to take it away. Uh, sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak tonight. Um, so Jenny contacted me a few, a couple of months ago and asked if I could join this series to, to say a bit on racism and science. And, you know, at first I, I jumped at the opportunity mostly because I kind of suspect that my colleagues invite me to give talks just to see how I can work dinosaur references into an ever wider, more disparate group of categories. Um, but after taking a look at the film series uh, that is associated with this series of talks, um, I, I found a claim in the film series that I thought was uh, pretty interesting and gave some important insight into how science works. And that's going to be my focus uh, for my talk tonight. So I'm going to share my screen. we get the presentation going there. All right. So I'm here to talk about racism and science. And as Jenny mentioned, uh, one of the points that I'm going to be elaborating on is this idea that race has no biological basis. But just as important uh, in my view is an explanation of one of the kind of bold claims that's implied in the film series. And that claim is this combination of propositions here. That on the one hand, race itself doesn't explain very much. But on the other hand, racism 
explains a lot. And on the face of it, this seems like it ought to be an almost paradoxical combination of statements. After all, how can there be racism if there is no such thing as race? Um, and there's obviously a lot that can be said about the difference between uh, biological categories and cultural categories, biological uh, transmission, cultural transmission in uh, evolutionary terms and all of that. But one thing that I thought would be useful would be to focus um, just as much on the idea of explanation, which is one of the fundamental concepts in scientific practice. Uh, so my plan for tonight is to first raise the various ethical issues that come up in discussions of race, and then to show how the difference between racial and racist explanations manifests as an example of how scientists set up explanations of the observations they make. And I'm then going to transition from that discussion into an explanation of how human races don't actually qualify as real biological groups. And finally, I'm going to consider the question of why that point should matter. Why is it that the scientific denial of the reality of race should actually mean anything to any of us? But before we get to that, uh, let's start with one of the most famous of philosophical conundrums. Um, and in this sense, uh, philosophers have gotten a real assist from popular media in the last few years. I'm sure that at least some of you who are following along right now are familiar with The Good Place, uh, a sitcom that ran on NBC for the last several years. Uh, one of the main characters being a philosopher. Uh, that is the character of Chidi Anagonye, pictured in the middle here. Um, and one of the uh, things that that show did really well was it illustrated how philosophers use a uh, methodology called the thought experiment to help make philosophical points. A thought experiment is a lot like a scientific experiment, the only difference being that you don't have any equipment and you're not given a budget. Um, but they're structurally similar in that in a thought experiment, you're given a situation and you hold certain variables in that situation constant. And when you fiddle with certain other variables, there should be some difference in your reaction to the situation as described. And it's the interrogation of why your reaction might differ between one uh, formulation of the situation and another version of the situation that hopefully explains some of your fundamental philosophical commitments. Uh, certainly the most frequently used of these thought experiments is one that featured in an episode of The Good Place, the one uh, pictured here, and that is the thought experiment of the trolley problem which I will explain uh, in, in just a moment. But in order to understand the power of the trolley problem, I think it's first uh, necessary to explain one of the more fundamental principles that underlies all moral reasoning, all moral philosophy. And that is the concept of the morally relevant difference. Um, this is really just a fancier way of explaining what fairness is, but morally relevant differences are defined such that a difference between two people is morally relevant if that difference reasonably explains why those people should be treated differently under the same circumstances. So we can imagine, for example, that two students might give me the same exam. Or, or might give me uh, two submissions for the same exam. Uh, and the two students have given me exactly the same answers. It is incumbent on me to give those students the same grade unless there is some morally relevant difference between them that would account for why I might give them different grades. Uh, 
So we wouldn't take it to be a morally relevant difference, for example, if one student was male and one was female. You know, if that's the only difference between these two students, then they deserve the same grade. If on the other hand, one of them got their answers through hard study and the other got their answers through copying the first student, that's a morally relevant difference. And it would justify my treating the students differently, giving one of them a passing grade and the other one um, at worst a failing grade and probably the way things work out these days, uh, some other punitive assignment or something like that. So let's bear this in mind, right? If we're going to treat people differently, there has to be some reasonable explanation as to why we're doing that. And this is where we come to the trolley problem itself. So again, this is a thought experiment. I am going to describe a situation to you and all you have to do is react to it. The details of how the situation came to be are, are not relevant, they're not necessary to explain. All that matters is that you make the choice that is given to you. In the trolley problem, we imagine that you're the conductor of a trolley. Uh, and you know, it's your first day on the job, let's say, and you're, you're going through your route and you come to a fork in the track. Um, and you look ahead on the track and for some reason, down the track that the trolley is currently going, there are five people tied up on the track. They are not able to move. They're not able to get out of the way. If you choose to do nothing, you will run over those five people. But you look down the other track to which you can switch by pulling a lever in the trolley. And you see that on that track, there is only one person tied up. The options available to you are to pull the lever and divert the trolley down the second track or to do nothing and to continue down the original track. Let's say you've also tested the brakes and they don't work or something like that. What would you do? Well, if you are like most people, and I think uh, from the most recent research that I've read, um, something around 90% of people polled with this problem um, will pull the lever and divert the trolley down the track that only has the one person. And if they're asked to explain why they did that, answers tend to converge on the idea of minimizing harm. That is to say, there's only one person on that one track, there are five people on the other track, that's a net savings of four lives if I pull the lever. So there it is. You know, it's interesting side note. Uh, when I used to teach in New York, the question of how the people on the tracks got there never came up. Um, students just, I guess, kind of accepted there. Like, yeah, tracks are where you would expect to find dudes just hanging out, not being able to get out of the way. Uh, but it's something that comes up every time I teach the trolley problem here. Anyway, so the explanation that tends to be offered is we're minimizing harm. We want to save lives. But there are some interesting twists that we can put on the trolley problem. This version was originally formulated by the philosopher Philippa Foote uh, in the 1970s, if I remember correctly. But what we find is that if we put just even the smallest twist on the way we set this story up, our explanations for why we make the choices that we do have a tendency to change completely. So in a second formulation of the trolley problem, we might imagine that you're no longer the conductor of the trolley, somebody else is conducting it, but you are standing on an overpass with a companion, watching as that trolley barrels down and approaches five people tied up on the track. The option available to you in this case is you can push your, uh, push your companion in front of the trolley, derailing it and preventing the trolley from running those five people over at the expense of your companion's life. What would you do? If you're like most respondents, you would say that, or you would probably say that you wouldn't do anything in this case. You wouldn't push your companion. You would just let the trolley proceed as it's going and kill the five people. Now, this seems utterly inconsistent 
with the explanation offered for why most people would pull the lever in the original version of this problem. After all, this is a similar case of minimizing harm. It's the life of one person measured against the lives of five. So why is it that people are concerned with minimizing harm in the first case, but not in the second? Philosopher Josh Noby out of Yale University did some research on respondents to this problem and found an interesting uh, neuropsychological explanation. And what Noby found was that when people are presented with the first version of the trolley problem, the part of the brain that's most active is the prefrontal cortex, which is normally associated with higher order mental processes, including math problems. When people are presented with the second case, however, the part of the brain that's most active is the amygdala, which is uh, most closely associated with emotional responses. The idea being that when I say it's five people versus one people, you're basically doing math. But when I tell you that you have a companion, you're imagining that person as um, a fully developed human being with hopes, dreams, credit card debt, all of that. And so your, the way that you assess the problem changes because it's literally a different part of your brain working things through. One more interesting twist on the trolley problem. Psychologist David Pizarro out of Cornell University put a new spin on the second version, the overpass version of this problem that has since come to be known as the kill whitey variation. And all that Pizarro suggested was that we might give the companion a name. And he had two options for the name of the companion that he presented to different participants. One of those names was Chip. The other name was Tyrone. And Pizarro admitted that the reason that he chose these names is because they struck him as stereotypically racial. And what Pizarro found is that very consistently and, and I don't actually have um, the numbers here, but I do know what the outcome of the research was. And that is that depending on someone's political persuasion, they were more or less comfortable pushing the, one per the person with the one name or the person with the other. As it turns out, liberals were more comfortable than conservatives pushing chip in front of the trolley. Whereas conservatives were more comfortable than liberals in pushing Tyrone in front of the trolley. And we might ask, why is that the case, right? One of the things that we want to assume of anybody with whom we're engaged in any sort of academic pursuit is some measure of good faith. You don't want to immediately jump to the idea that the person you're talking to is a racist. So why is it that it seems as though liberals are more comfortable pushing the guy with the white name and conservatives are more comfortable pushing the guy with the black name uh, in such a way that it has an effect on the outcomes of our responses to the trolley problem. Well, there are a few different ways we might answer this question and all of them relate to the question of how explanations work. So I'm gonna come back uh, briefly to uh, the point of um, what the different explanations might be. But first, I, I think that uh, it being the day that it is, it is incumbent on me to note the grim milestone that we reached today. Uh, and that is that today is the day that the United States passed 500,000 uh, deaths due to COVID-19. Um, that is a massive number. Uh, I saw someone actually run the calculations. Uh, that is on average one person dying every minute for the past 340 days. We've learned a lot about COVID-19 in the past year. Um, and it's important to note that as we have witnessed, others learn a lot about this virus we have personally observed the scientific process in action. We have seen scientists formulate hypotheses, collect observations, test their theories, and report their outcomes all in real time. And this has been, you know, uh, 
intensely um, personally interesting to almost everybody paying attention. And the way that all of that has worked gives some pretty clear examples of how explanations work in the sciences. Um, you might ask, for example, why is it that hand washing was one of the very first mitigating activities that scientists suggested for combating COVID-19? Uh, well, I can give you the explanation for that, but in order to understand why it's a reasonable and effective explanation, I have to first explain one of the fundamental ideas in philosophy of science. And that is what's called the principle of structural identity. According to the principle of structural identity, every adequate explanation also makes accurate predictions. So why is it that hand washing is an effective activity for combating the spread of COVID-19? The explanation that was offered to me is that the COVID-19 virus is enveloped in a membrane that's made up of molecules called lipids. Those are basically fats. And what that means is that the outer membrane of the virus has a consistency kind of like microscopic butter. Now, if you compare uh, that with your more familiar observations of butter, for example, as you're scrubbing your dishes, what you're likely to find is that scrubbing your dishes with soap is a lot, makes them a lot cleaner, a lot faster than just scrubbing them with water. And the reason for that is that soap has a molecular structure that is attracted to fats like butter and is repelled by water. So if COVID-19 has, has a molecular membrane uh, that is similar to butter, then it stands to reason that washing with soap ought to be just as effective uh, in, in washing it off your hands as um, using soap to wash your dishes would be. And this also makes certain predictions. So if the consistency of the envelope surrounding the COVID-19 virus is, has the consistency of butter, it would also stand to reason that if the virus were left out in a warm area, that its membrane would melt and the virus would rapidly become um, inviolable. And lo and behold, this is one of the reasons that scientists predicted that in warm weather, the virus would be uh, less transmissible, which did seem to be the case in a number of observations made over time. So this is an effective explanation of why hand washing works for COVID-19. And the reason that it's effective is because we have identified an appropriate cause-effect relation. Cause-effect relations, when we have identified them correctly, are stable over time. And so if I can explain some past event by inferring from the effect back to its cause, then that means that I can also predict that the next time I am presented with the appropriate cause, I should be able to predict the uh, effect that follows. So every explanation makes predictions, and this is because explanations and predictions alike make reference to cause-effect relations. So what does this have to do with the trolley problem? What does this have to do with an explanation of why it is uh, that people um, are influenced by racial considerations when answering trolley problem questions? Well, that's also related to another fact that we've learned about COVID-19, and that is that there is a racial disparity in mortality rates in the United States uh, among people afflicted with COVID-19. And we might ask, why is that the case? And as with the trolley problem, there are two different kinds of explanation that we might offer. One kind of explanation cites race as the uh, causal characteristic. And to say this would mean that we are saying that there is some characteristic intrinsic 
to people in various racial groups, that there are certain characteristics that because you are in a certain race, you must have that explains why you are more or less likely to die from complications due to COVID-19 or why you are more or less likely to be pushed by, pushed by a companion in front of a runaway trolley. Those are explanations that invoke race. These explanations require some grounding in genetics or biology. By contrast, explanations that invoke racism cite characteristics that are extrinsic to the racial groups. That is to say, how other people are interacting with individuals in those racial groups. And these are explanations that are grounded in either sociological or anthropological uh, observation. So when I noted at the beginning of this presentation that an implication of the film series was that race doesn't explain much, but racism explains quite a bit, what we're really getting to is a difference in the eff efficacy of these two different kinds of explanation. And the reason for this ultimately comes down to the biological origins of race or the lack thereof. So let's talk a bit about that. So there's a fundamental split in the history of biology that comes in the year 1859. And that is the year of the publication of Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species. Prior to that point, almost all biology that had been practiced was most deeply influenced by the philosopher Aristotle. And the most important difference between these two thinkers was in their thinking about the reality of biological groups. For Aristotle, Membership in a biological group explained almost everything about an organism. The reason being that Aristotle believed that all species have essences that propagate from one generation to the next. So the reason, for example, that my son is a human being is because I gave to him the essence of being a human. And because Aristotle was an ancient Greek, of course, there was a sexist element in there too. It was me, the male, who passed on the essence of being human. My, my uh, partner only contributed the uh, raw materials, according to Aristotle. We don't need to quibble over the details. The important point is that essences are important because they explain why individuals have certain characteristics. So because I have passed on the essence of Homo sapiens to my son, we would expect that my son is going to grow up to become a rational animal. He should be able to read and write and do math and all of those things. And so one of the implications of Aristotle's biology is that each individual in a group has some specific characteristic shared in common with other individuals in the same group. Okay, so, so um, this is the idea that group membership defines who you are. Darwin, by contrast, denied Aristotle's view because Darwin believed that all species evolved by natural selection. And natural selection requires three components. There must be variation among individuals in a population. And those variations must be inheritable from one generation to the next. If there is some kind of competition between individuals for some resource, such that one variation will make one individual more likely to survive, to pass its genes on to the next generation than some other individual, then beneficial variations will spread throughout the population over time. And this is how evolution works. But since variation is a fundamentally important point there for natural selection to work, if Darwin's right and all species evolve by natural selection, it must follow that there is no one characteristic shared by all individuals in any given group. Variation is a fundamental fact of biology. You might wonder then, how is it that we identify groups in biology? Well, I'm going to turn to an example here that I am uh, most comfortable talking about, and this is where the dinosaur reference comes in. So most of you following along can 
probably identify this dinosaur here, and you would probably identify it as Brontosaurus. This is a painting from Charles Knight. It can currently be found in the Field Museum in Chicago. Now, some of you, depending on your um, knowledge of dinosaur history, might remember that people like me, uh, who sort of acted as paleontological gatekeepers until they recognized that gatekeeping is not a great thing to do, um, used to respond to any reference to the name Brontosaurus by saying, Brontosaurus is not a real dinosaur. It's actually just a misnamed Apatosaurus. Well, a few years ago, some paleontologists out of Lisbon demonstrated that that's not really the case and that Brontosaurus is actually a real name of a real dinosaur group. And their reasoning was as follows. The clade, a clade is a biological group, comprising Apatosaurus is separated from its sister clade, Brontosaurus, by 11 changes. Mean pairwise dissimilarity between specimens of Apatosaurus and those of Brontosaurus supports generic distinction. Intergeneric mean pairwise dissimilarity is lower than what is found between the two groups. I think that's fairly self-explanatory. I'll just leave you to work out the details. But just in case there's anybody who does want me to explain it, uh, what this passage is saying is that there are certain dinosaur groups that we know to be different and certain dinosaur groups that we know to be the same. So we might know, for example, that there are two individual dinosaur specimens that belong in the same group, the group named Apatosaurus. And if we compare those two individuals with another one, one that perhaps has been named Brontosaurus, what we find in this case is that the differences between the individual named Brontosaurus and either of the two individuals named Apatosaurus is greater than the differences just between the two individuals named Apatosaurus. That is to say, if you are in the same group, you are more similar to other members of that group than you are to members of a different group. And this is the fundamental point in how biologists recognize the reality of different groups. So, in a real biological group, the differences between individuals will be comparatively small. And if you're given two different biological groups, the differences between individuals will be comparatively large. And observation is what determines the appropriate point of comparison. That is to say, the amount of difference within a certain group or between different groups will vary depending on the kind of biological group that you're talking about. Humans, for example, are a relatively a homogenous group. Genetically speaking, we are among the most inbred species on the planet right now. Uh, the, the only real competition that we have seems to be among cheetahs. Cheetahs are another very inbred uh, group. Um, and when I say inbred, what I mean is very low genetic diversity owing to the fact that there isn't much variation coming in from a lot of interbreeding with um, marginalized groups. In any event, uh, there's relatively little genetic variation among human beings. But within that genetic variation, can we still identify regular, real biological groups? This is the question that the evolutionary biologist Richard Lewontin examined in 1972 in, in this famous paper, The Apportionment of Human Diversity. And what Lewontin found is that this concept of pairwise dissimilarity, that is to say the amount of difference between two individuals in different human races. So if you are to randomly pick any one individual from one race and any one individual from another race, on average, the amount of genetic difference that you will find in the portion of the human genome that actually differs from person to person will come to about 6% of their DNA, or 6% of the DNA that differs between people. So if races are real biological groups, then it should follow that this difference is going to be larger than the amount of difference that you find between two individuals within any one group. 
And what Lewontin found is the opposite that the amount of dissimilarity between two individuals within any one race tends to average to about 8% of the genetic difference between human beings. And so contrary to the way biologists normally define real groups, what Lewontin found is that there is more difference within one group and less difference between different groups. So the differences between individuals in the same race are comparatively large, and the differences between individuals in different races are comparatively small. And it follows then that human races are not real biological groups. This finding has since been uh, disputed in, in um, some research that's been done, but also largely upheld by a variety of researchers, both in biology and philosophy. As a matter of fact, my academic grandfather, the uh, dissertation advisor of my dissertation advisor, uh, that is Jonathan Kaplan at uh, Oregon State University, has done a lot of work on this point, and, and he largely upholds uh, Lewontin's research. In any event, um, racism does seem to persist. So, you know, why is that the case? Why is it, or, or why is it that we should care that biologists have found that human races are not real biological groups? Should that have an impact on how we respond to the trolley problem? Should that have an effect on how we treat different people for COVID-19? And this is where we come to the question of why science in general is important. And many of you have probably come across this quote from the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. The good thing about science is that it's true whether, you, whether or not you believe in it. There are a few uh, linguistic points I might quibble about with respect to this uh, quote here, but it does make a certain important point about the authority of science. That is to say that even among those who tend to challenge scientific research, beliefs inferred through scientific methods tend to carry more authority than other beliefs. Even if you're an anti-vaxxer, for example, you will still seize upon scientific research that supports the beliefs that you hold. If you're a flat earther, if there is scientific research that supports your idea that the earth is flat, then that is going to be your go-to reference in arguments about the shape of the earth. If you're a creationist, then you will certainly seize on the work of scientists such as Michael Behe, who um, purports to have demonstrated that there is insufficient scientific evidence for natural selection. The point being that if you can have a scientific foundation for your belief, it is widely believed that that foundation carries more authority than other foundations we might find. The reason for this being that we tend to give greater weight to inferences that rest upon a foundation of evidence. And it is the nature of science, it is a necessary component of scientific inference that there be shareable observational evidence that underlies whatever inference it is you're drawing. And so what folks like Neil deGrasse Tyson would have us believe, it should follow then that scientific inferences are more impartial and less influenced by personal bias than other beliefs. After all, the evidence can be observed and it can be shared by, by a variety of different observers. And since you have that variety of different observers all looking at the same evidence, then their individual biases should tend to cancel out. What's interesting then, sociologically speaking, is just how much uh, race does seem to factor into scientific outcomes. So this is some research that came out about five, about six years ago, demonstrating how relatively few minority students tend to get PhDs. Uh, in particular, uh, this is the proportion of black PhDs by various fields, um, also organized by the degree to which the field uh, emphasizes the concept of brilliance, which is not something I'm really gonna touch on here. But what we see, for example, is that there are almost no black evolutionary biologists, for example. Uh, there, there are about uh, 
among all mathematicians, only about 3% identify as black. Similarly for philosophy. Uh, among neuroscientists, only about 4% identify as black, about 4 or 5% of chemists identify as black, and there is no science out there wherein the number of PhDs identifying as black exceeds 8%. So what's the explanation for that? Do we invoke the racial characteristics, which as we have already noted, don't have any real biological basis? What would it mean to invoke a racist explanation? And this is where we come to the idea of structural racism. So this is some research that uh, was, was actually just released on social media a couple of days ago, showing the uh, cost of equipment for field work, making the argument that there are certain structural socioeconomic barriers that students are more or less likely to come across depending upon their socioeconomic background, which tends to correlate very roughly with race. So in my field, paleontology, these are the tools that you're going to need for any kind of field experience. And you cannot get your degree without having field experience. You need a backpack. You need boots, rain gear, pants, socks, work gloves, water bottles, hats, notebooks, hand lens, pencils, fancy pencils, I must note, uh, markers, fancy markers, I must note, sunscreen, I say this as someone from a family with a, a predisposition towards skin cancer, um, I cover head to toe in the field, and that is not cheap. And you're going to need a first aid kit because you fall down all the time in the field. This is to say nothing of specialized tools like rock hammers and what have you, collection bags, uh, the sort of glue that we need to hold together broken fossils in the field. You know, students have to buy all this stuff. And if they can't afford it, then they just leave the field. So this is the sort of explanation that invokes extrinsic factors. It has nothing to do with any biological characteristic of the student in question. But by virtue of socioeconomic status, which again tends to correlate with perceptions of race, certain students are going to be left behind. So that is what constitutes a racist explanation or a, an explanation that invokes racism rather than race. It doesn't have to be a conscious choice on anybody's part to say we are going to exclude individuals in this group. It is rather an invocation of some cause that is related to race, but not consciously applied. And that accounts for differential treatment. So what are some conclusions we can draw? First, that races are not real biological groups. And so Explanations that invoke race in that biological sense as a causal factor must be false. By contrast, socioeconomic context is more predictive of racial disparities. I can more easily predict whether or not someone is going to become a field scientist if you tell me how much money their parents make than if you tell me what their race is. And so it follows that true explanations of racial disparities are more likely to cite racism rather than race. On that note, um, I wanted to close by dedicating this presentation to the memory of a good friend of mine who passed the week before last. Uh, Richard Thompson was a, a local in Yamhill County. Uh, he was a great supporter of the liberal arts. Uh, really rooted for the success of Linfield and its faculty. Uh, and he was a, a strong voice for social justice in our county. And he will be uh, sorely missed. And, and I am proud to have called him friend and, and I will miss him personally. So this presentation is dedicated to his memory. Miss you, Richard. And here's the proof that I didn't just make things up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonard. I'll stop screen sharing now. There we go. Thank you so much, Leonard. Thank you. Um, so this concludes our discussion of the film series, but the films are still available um, on both the Public Library and Linfield University's um, website. 
There is um, a link to the films and to the discussion guide. We're hoping that all of you will join us this um, in March as we read our first book in the series, Me and White Supremacy by um, Layla Sadi. Um, Combat Racism, Change the World and Become a Good Ancestor. And this is, um, for those of you not familiar with the book, the book is in two parts. One is the introduction and the second part is um, the work. And so um, Layla wrote this book initially as a Twitter challenge to um, invite people to examine concepts like white fragility and white supremacy, belonging and exclusion. Um, and it became this book. And so it is a 28 day journey to looking at your own internalization of white supremacy and also taking the time to notice white supremacy in your community and in your society. Um, so we'll be reconvening on March the 26th, same time, same channel, um, 6 p.m. Um, and Linfield professor Rajmi Bolestad is going to be leading our book discussion. Copies of the book are available um, to check out at both libraries. Um, Linfield patrons can also download a free ebook copy. We are also, they're also available for sale at um, Third Street Books. And then here on the campus starting, I think I'll be taking them around on Thursday. There'll also be free copies. And the free copies are brought to you by the Friends of Nicholson Library. And so I just wanna kind of end my part by saying that these are tough discussions and it's really important um, as you work through these, these ideas and concepts to be easy on yourself um, and, and really take the time for the process. Jenny, do you have anything you'd like to add this evening? Thanks for those comments, Jenny. Um, and thank you also, Leonard, that was uh, a fantastic uh, talk. Um, Ginny, you you mentioned early on in your introduction about, you know, this is not about shaming anyone or making anyone feel bad. And um, I think that's really important to remember. Uh, this is about awareness and um, reading, reading the book, Me and White Supremacy, um, it just starts making you think in a different way and notice things in a different way. And, and it's a as I've heard many times, and it's a it's an ongoing process. It's almost a practice more than than a, oh well now I've figured this all out. And um, that's something worth keeping in mind as you're reading. You know what what you think about now is going to be different than what you might think about um, two months from now. Your awareness will be different, um, and that seems like always a good thing to me to raise awareness, raise your own personal awareness. So I want to thank everyone and um, please find a copy of the book. Um, it, it really is, um, you know, it, it's so well put together um, and just a really good, good, one of the best, um, one of the best books I've ever read and really a very, very unique, unique book. Um, if you're interested, um, Layla Sadi has a podcast. You can just you can just Google her, um, as well as she has what's called the Ancestors Academy, where she teaches lessons about being what she calls a good ancestor. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Leonard, and I hope to see all of you back on the 26th. Have a great evening. Thanks, Jenny. <laughs>